Hello, and welcome to Lesson 16 of Denominational Doctrines. You know, if you live in this country, and I suppose it's true in just about every country, if you should ask one, what must I do to be saved, then you'd get all kinds of answers. One might say, as we've already been studying in Calvinism, well, there's nothing you can do to be saved. God chose you from the foundation of the world to be saved, or else he did not. Others might come along and say you're saved by grace only, or faith only, or come to the mourner's bench, or pray the sinner's prayer. Various and sundry things you might hear. Of course, this is very confusing. God never intended for it to be that way. God did not intend for you to teach one plan of salvation and for me to teach another. Can you imagine trying to teach your children the simple plan of salvation when the wife believes one thing and the husband believes something else? God is not the author of confusion. So there are many false doctrines out there relative to the plan of salvation. And in this lesson, we want to look at some of those false doctrines dealing with the plan of salvation. One of them is faith only. We have those who teach that one is saved by faith only. They have affirmed this in public debates. They state this on the radio. And you know what amazes me? They'll say, well, you're saved by faith only. And then you can ask them something very simple like, well, must one repent? Well, yeah, he's going to have to repent. Well, then, friends, it's not faith only. Let me read you a statement from the Methodist and then one from the Baptist that you might see where they're coming from. And by the way, usually I just read the statements here. In the notes, they're documented where we got the statements and so forth. We are, this is from the Methodist. We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by faith and not for our works of deservings. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. So notice then, the Methodists make no bones about it. They state that one is saved by faith only. Now listen to this statement from the Baptist. The scriptures teach that faith in Christ procures salvation without any further acts of obedience. So here again, you've got the Baptist coming along and saying it is by faith only. In our area, we have a preacher right now with whom we're trying to study, a Baptist preacher, on this very subject. And he is so wrapped up on the doctrine of faith only, I asked him, must one confess Jesus Christ before men? And I couldn't get him to say yes. You see, he doesn't want to violate his doctrine of faith only. But Jesus made a comment on that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, 33, If you will not confess me before men, then I will not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. So then we've got to confess our Lord before men. Not only that, I asked him, must one who practice, practices homosexuality give it up in order to be saved? He wouldn't say yes. Why? Because he tried to be consistent by not violating his doctrine of faith only. Now this is where false doctrines lead a man. They get him into all kinds of trouble. Truth is consistent. See, because I believe the truth on the subject, I could say, look, a man's got to confess Jesus or be lost. A man's got to come out of homosexuality or be lost. Because this is what the Word of God says. Now, the denominational world uses one verse after another that says man is saved by faith, and they read into it the concept of only, such as verses like John 3.16, Romans 5.1. Hebrews 11, 6, John 11, 25, 26, Acts 16, 30, and 31, and on we could go. I went to a debate one time between F.L. Ray, a Baptist preacher, and Bill Jackson in Jackson, Tennessee. The Baptist preacher put up chart after chart with verses on it that declare that man is saved by faith. Bill Jackson got up and said, we don't deny any of those. We believe man is saved by faith. 
But where in the world is the verse that you need that says that man is saved by faith alone? Friends, that's the issue. Where is the verse that says that man is saved by faith alone? It's not in the Bible. Listen to this verse. This is Romans 5.1, one one of the ones we had on the chart you just saw. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wesley, you believe that? With all my heart. We're justified by faith, but not faith only. My faith led me to confess Jesus. My faith led me to repent. My faith led me to be baptized for the remission of sins. And on and on I could go with every act of obedience. It takes faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6. You know, some Baptist preachers, about all they know is Acts 16, 30 and 31. They don't do like Paul Harvey encourages them to do. Read the rest of the story. you got to read the rest of the conversion and see what else the Philippian jailer and his household did. Well, you know, the word faith, our belief, is used three ways, basically, in the New Testament. And we want to look at those and see how the Word of God uses the word faith. Number one, faith, our belief, is used to denote one's personal faith. And we see this in the case of the Syrophoenician woman. We see this in the case of the disciples in the storm. We see this in the case of the centurion. Let me just read uh, one of these, or, or maybe more. In the case of the woman of Syrophoenicia, in Matthew fifteen twenty eight, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Notice, he commends her for her faith. In the case of the disciples, in Matthew eight twenty six, and he said unto them, why are you fearful, all ye of little faith? And then he says to the centurion that he had not seen so great faith, not in Israel. So you see, here we have the Lord using the word faith as it relates to an individual. Either you got a little faith, no faith, or you've got great faith, and so forth. Then secondly, I want you to notice that the word of God uses the word faith in relationship to the system of faith. We see this in Galatians 3, 22 through 25, Ephesians 4, 5, and also Jude 3. Now let me show you this from the Word of God so that you'll see where I'm coming, coming from, so you'll understand this concept of how the Bible uses the word faith. In Galatians 3, beginning with verse number 23, but before faith came, wait a minute, you mean to tell me Abraham did not have faith? You mean to tell me Moses did not have faith? You mean to tell me Noah did not have faith? You mean to tell me all those great people in the Old Testament did not have faith? It's not talking about that. It's talking about the system of faith, the New Testament. Now let's go on. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Now notice the contrast. Let this represent the Old Testament. Kept under the law. Then it goes on to say, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Notice, a faith that was revealed. That's the kind of faith that's under consideration. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Speaking of the system of faith, but after that faith is come, the system of faith, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, the Old Testament law. Then in Ephesians 4, 5, the Bible says there is one Lord, one faith. Notice, one faith. Well, if there's only one faith, if it's not talking about the system of faith, is it talking about your faith or mine? Well, it's not talking about your faith. It's not talking about mine. It's talking about the system of faith. Then in Jude 3, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. Notice, we are to contend for the faith. So we have noticed that the word faith so far can be used to refer to one's personal faith or to the system of faith, but it can also be used to refer to obedience. 
Faith is used this way in John 3.16, in Numbers 20, 10 through 12, in Romans 10, 13 through 16. Now let's look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now if you understand that verse correctly, the concept there of believing in Christ takes into consideration obeying Christ. Believe what? Whatever the Christ says. Now in John 3.16, for instance, you don't find the word repentance. Must one repent? My brother, I love him to death, great fellow. He said, Wesley, all you got to know to be saved is John 3.16. And I said, well, Ed, if you understand it correctly, that's all right. But now you're trying to tell me faith only saves. That's right. Where's repentance? I asked him, where's repentance in that verse? Oh, if you believe you're going to want to repent. No, no, no. Where is repentance in that verse? Well, it's included. Where is confessing the Christ? Well, it's included. Where is baptism? See, and he doesn't really like baptism all that much. Even though Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. You see, if I am a believer, then I'm going to believe whatever the Lord says. And John 3.16 teaches that. We're going to show that to you in greater detail a little bit later in our study. Look at Numbers 20, beginning with verse number 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank in their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron and said, Because ye believed me not. Now notice the Lord says, You don't believe me. Well, Moses, Aaron, do you believe in God? Absolutely. But now God's calling them disbelievers. Why is God calling them disbelievers? People who do not believe him. Because they did not obey. Now, when they did not obey, then in the sight of God, they were disbelievers. Can you not see that God is tying together the concept of believing and obeying? He's tying those things together. If Moses would have done what God said, he would have been a believer. When he did not do what God said, he became a disbeliever. And so when you and I see this concept then we can understand what it means to be a believer. In Romans 10, beginning with verse number 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Notice how they're going to call if they've not believed. Don't forget that believed part. And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now watch this. But, contrast, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now wait a minute. What was he trying to make out of them? Believers. But not all had obeyed. Can you not see the connection between believing and obeying? God, they've not all believed. What's your attitude toward that? Then they've not obeyed. They've not all obeyed, Lord. What's your attitude toward that? They've not believed. And so then the word believe, faith, sometimes is connected in the Bible with the concept of obedience. So we've noticed the word faith is used to refer to one's individual faith, the system of faith, and obedience. And this is very important to understand. Now notice, verses which answer the false doctrine of faith only. Here's one, John 12, 42, 43. Now we have those who say, look, you're saved by faith only. Well, let's see if these people were, okay? They believed. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. Is that good enough? These preachers say all you got to do is believe. They believed. That ought to be good enough. But it's not good enough 
because the Bible says, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now here are some chief priests and rulers who believed in Jesus Christ, but they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. They did not want to confess the Christ. And because they would not confess the Christ, the Bible says they love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. You mean to tell me believers like that can be saved? Absolutely not. So I see that faith only won't save. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32, 33. That includes these individuals right here. Then we look at James uh, 2, 19 through 26. Notice what the Bible says. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Even the devils don't believe in faith only. They tremble in addition to their faith. But even though they believe, they believe God's out there. They believe that with all their heart. But nevertheless, they're not obedient. And since they're not obedient, then they cannot be saved. Then he goes on to say, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Notice, faith without works is dead. I just soon ride a dead horse, as I mentioned the other day, from here back home, try to do that, as to ride a dead faith from here to heaven. Neither one of them is going to get the job done. Then verse 21 says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? All the religious world hates that word. But the Holy Spirit, God in Christ, had it put in your Bible and in mine. We need not hate it. Now listen, you can't work your way to heaven and neither can I. But we've got to do the works that God has given for us to do. When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. Can you go to heaven without a perfect faith? Can you go to heaven on a dead faith? Can you go to heaven with an inactive faith? Not at all. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God. Now notice, Abraham believed God. Do you see the connection? God said, go offer your son Isaac. When he was willing to go offer his son Isaac, then and only then is he said to be a believer. So then there is a connection between obedience and faith. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. When are you the friend of God? When am I the friend of God? Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. we got to be the friends of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The Bible says that we are justified by some works and not by faith only. What works? The things that God has asked us to do. We're not trying to work our way to heaven. We're trying to, in a very loving and kind way, respond to God Almighty and do whatever he asked us to do. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So faith without works, folks, is dead. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, we see that faith only will not save. This answers that doctrine. Listen to these verses very carefully. They show you, they show me, faith only cannot save. Though I speak, with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's love, I am become as a sound and brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, now watch this, and though I have all faith, and not just some faith, all faith, then he goes on to say, so that I can remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Friends, the Bible says if you had faith so great that you could remove mountains and you don't have love, 
You're nothing. You've got to have love, according to the teaching of the Bible. Faith only will not save you. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So then, with my faith, I've got to have love. Otherwise, it does not benefit me, and I will be lost. In Second Peter 1, five, we have another verse that answers the false doctrine of faith only. Here we're talking about the Christian graces. And the Bible says, and beside this, and the Bible says that these individuals had escaped the pollutions of the world and that they were to be partakers of the divine nature. It says, Give, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Notice, you're to add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And it goes on and names the Christian graces. And then it says, and if you do these things, ye shall never fall. As a matter of fact, you make your calling and your election sure. Well, what if you don't do these things? Then it implies that you will fall. And you certainly do not make your calling and your election sure. In Galatians 5, verse number 6, we have another verse that exposes the false doctrine of faith only. Listen to what the Bible says. For Christ Jesus, uh, for in uh, Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now again, notice you've got to have a faith that works. But how does this faith work? It works by love. What kind of love? The kind of love that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant will obey. You tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. That's the kind of love that you and I have got to have. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. In Romans 1, 5, we have an interesting verse. You know, people, these faith-only preachers go to the book of Romans to try to show there's absolutely no obedience involved. It's a matter of faith only. But it's amazing how that the inspired writer, Paul, and the Holy Spirit put one verse at the beginning and one at the end and verses all in between to show this doctrine to be false. Listen to Romans 1.5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for, notice, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Notice, for the obedience of of faith. And yet they don't see that word obedience. And then at the end of the book, in Romans 16, 26, another verse that answers the false doctrine of faith only. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Notice then, faith is to be that which is obedient. I am to have the attitude, if God asks me to do a thing, then I will do it. Why, Wesley? Because I love God. Now, another great chapter that destroys the concept of faith only is Hebrews chapter 11. Now, all down through here, you've got concepts of faith in action. For instance, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Notice, he did this by faith. His faith caused him to do something. What did his faith cause him to do? Offer that which God had commanded. That's faith in action. Then look at Noah. By faith, Noah moved. What did he move to do? Prepare an ark. Now notice, in each of these accounts, where the Bible says these men are justified by faith, they did something. In the case of Abraham, here's a man who obeyed. He, were, he was willing to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go wherever God wanted him to go. And then when you look at verse number 10, Abraham, by faith, looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham, by faith, offered up Isaac according to verse number 17. Now we read a moment ago in James chapter 2 where this kind of works was that which was pleasing to God. 
then Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had to make a choice. Verse 25, he chose the afflictions of God's children rather than to be down in Egypt and enjoy the riches thereof. Then by faith, Moses forsook Egypt. Verse number 27, through faith, Moses kept certain things that God had commanded. Verse number 28, by faith, Israel passed through the Red Sea. Then by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been compassed about by the children of Israel. Then by faith, Rahab did not perish because she received the messengers. Can you not see in each case faith in action? That's James chapter 2. Friends, faith only will not save. Faith only is a false doctrine. Now notice when we come to Romans 6, 17 and 18, again, beautiful verses that show that faith only will not save. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. So here we have a situation of where people were willing to obey from the heart that form of doctrine and be pleasing to God. Hebrews 5, 8, 9, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience for the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, and 8, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice you've got to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in Matthew 23, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cunning, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Now watch. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. See, God knows that some things ought to be done. Well, Lord, what should be done? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. If we do the will, we're obedient. If we're obedient, we're pleasing to God, and thus we're going to be saved. Now, there's just a few verses that show that the false doctrine of faith only will not stand. I could have kept going. I could have shown the plan of salvation, how that the plan of salvation is denied and so forth, such as repentance, confession, and baptism. And all of that would have just built more weight to demonstrate that faith only is a false doctrine. Now let's go on and look at the concept that we are not saved by grace only either. There are those who want us to believe that we're saved by grace only. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on grace only because we covered this under Calvinism. When the Calvinists tried to declare that we're saved by grace only, there's nothing we can do. God chose us from all eternity to be saved. You know, I listen to these uh, preachers on radio, and they'll say something like this. You're saved by grace only. There's nothing you can do. You can't work your way to heaven, so don't try to do anything. And then before they go off the air, they'll ask you to accept Jesus. They'll ask you to do this or do that. Well, I thought it was grace only. If it's grace only, folks, I don't have to do anything. It's like some of the false teachers, even in our great brotherhood, who have begun to say that you do not contribute one whit to your own salvation. Well, if you don't, then, my friends, everybody's got to be saved. If not, why not? Now, let's look at some of these things. If we're saved by grace only, then all men will be saved because this means that God does everything and we do nothing. Now, that's got to be the case. And if that's not the case, then, friends, the doctrine of faith, uh, faith, uh, grace only would be ridiculous to say you're saved by grace only 
and then try to say, well, you've got to do this, 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 and this. No, it's got to be unconditional if it's grace only. Notice point two. However, we know that all men will not be saved. Therefore, we know that men are not saved by grace only. This means that man has a part in his salvation. See, if it's grace only, Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, so everybody would have it. Well, everybody doesn't have it. The Bible makes that plain. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Well, if that's the case, then what makes the difference? How come some are going to be saved, some are going to be lost? And that's because that salvation is conditional. Let's look at Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I want you to notice that the grace of God teaches us certain things. It teaches us that we ought to live a certain way. Well, then how ought we to live? It says we ought to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That makes salvation conditional. That God expects me to live a certain way and to respond a certain way to what he has said. Now, friends... Don't forget the verse we just read, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. But why won't all men be saved? Here's the answer. Saving grace is located in Christ. A lot of people don't realize that. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Saving grace is located when we talk about the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, we're talking about that it has offered the possibility of salvation to all who will accept it because Jesus died for all men. He's given a gospel that's for all men. He has a plan of salvation that can be obeyed by all men and so forth. But now notice, as we did a moment ago, saving grace is in Christ, Second Timothy 2.1. Well, you know what the obvious question is, do you not? How do we get into Christ? This we've got to know. When one turns to the book of Romans and reads verses uh, uh, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, notice that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice then, one has got to believe. One has got to do what God asks. Then one's got to repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Then notice that one has got to confess. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, 32, 33, that if you will not confess me before men, then I will not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. Then in Romans 6, 3 and 4, the Bible tells us how we get into Christ. Now keep in mind, saving grace is located. It is located in Christ Jesus. The obvious question is how does one get into Christ? Listen to these verses. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I was studying with a Baptist preacher one time in Damascus, Virginia. And I said to him, Calvin, do you believe that all spiritual blessings are in Christ? He said yes, he had to. Ephesians 1 verse number 3 declares that. We have... Remission of sins in Christ, Ephesians 1, 7. Our inheritance is in Christ, Ephesians 1, 11. Eternal life is in Christ, 1 John 5, 10 and 11. Salvation is in Christ, according to 2 Timothy 2, 10. And saving grace is located in Christ, according to 2 Timothy 2, 1. I said, all right, Calvin, you believe that all these wonderful things are in Christ, right? That's right. Would you mind telling me how one gets into Christ? He said, well, let me tell you, Wesley, one's got to be saved by the blood. I said, I buy that. 
No problem. But tell me how to get into Christ. Well, you got to be saved by grace. I buy that. No problem. Tell me how to get into Christ. Well, you're going to have to be saved by faith. I buy that. No problem. Tell me how to get into Christ. For about 15 or 20 minutes, he tried over and over and over again to show me how one gets into Christ. And finally, he had to say, I don't know. He said, now, you tell me how one gets into Christ. And then I did like I did right here with the plan of salvation and showed him the final step, which he denies, that one is baptized into Christ. And he didn't want to admit that. So you got to believe, repent, confess, and finally you're baptized into Christ. Friends, you can know the very moment you're in Christ, where all spiritual blessings are located, you can know the very moment you're saved. God wants you to know when you cross from a lost state to a saved state, the plan of salvation is not difficult. One is not saved by anything only. As wonderful as the blood of Jesus is, you're not saved by the blood of Jesus only. As great as the grace of God is, you're not saved by the grace of God only. And as great as faith is, you're not saved by faith only. Now notice, if we are saved by grace only, then the rich young ruler was saved even though he walked away from the Lord. Matthew 10, 17 through 22. At least that's a possibility. Well, he, he came to the Lord and the Lord went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And since he was of the house of Israel and some declare these are the elect people, then why would he not have been saved? Well, he would have been saved if that be the case. But see, that's not the case. When he walked away from Jesus, he walked away from his only hope. When you and I walk away from Jesus Christ, we walk away from our only hope. The doctrine of grace only is a false doctrine. The doctrine of faith only is a false doctrine. The doctrine of anything only is a false doctrine. Well, then what are you saying? I'm saying the sum of God's word is truth. And if God says you're saved by this, 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 and this, it will take every one of those things to save one. Nothing more and nothing less. And that's what we're trying to teach when it comes to the gospel plan of salvation. Well, that old clock has caught us. We hope that you'll continue to study hard in the area of denominational doctrines. And be sure and join us for our next class.